The Japanese car market is on fire right now, but the question is, is this a good time to buy? Now that we're about to start these JDM Legends build series, we figured now is as good a time as any to talk about the prices of Japanese sports cars, you know, Japanese halo cars, yeah. and how they have just exploded over the last year, and whether that's a correction in market value to better reflect supply and demand, or is it a bubble that's being caused by you know global forces and people are going to be left holding cars that are way Overvalued. Overvalued, yeah. The disclaimer is, this is our opinion. We are by no means car collectors, experts. Uh, we're just two guys that follow the market very closely as, you know, it's our business to be buying vehicles at the bottom barrel yeah. uh, of the market and then kind of restoring them. So uh, I guess the first thing that we want to talk about is the current state of, I think, the economy, mm -hmm. uh, what we've seen. You know, there is a, a certain inflation happening right now globally yeah, sure. with money and you know I think that's translated into the car market and the timing has kind of lined itself up where we have a lot of people now having more income we've all been sitting at home yeah people have been stashing away their cash mm -hmm. and it's turned into a thing where you know car guys are looking at the market saying, wow, I can actually buy a bunch of stuff. Well, you, you could, but now yeah. it's like, it's all kind of slowly coming up, right? Yeah. So I think that's a huge factor playing into what's going on right now. Our, our money is essentially devalued, right? For sure it is. I mean, look at the cost of lumber, look at the cost of anything right now, and our buying power has gone down yeah. dramatically, which makes it confusing to me why people are willing to pay these inflated prices for cars when your dollar is not going nearly as far as it would in all areas of your life. So I, I find it a bit confusing, but I, I also understand that there is an element of FOMO going on here because you know you see these dream cars, you grew up playing the Sony PlayStation, playing on you know GTRs and all these FDs and all these cool cars, and now you see their prices escalate and you, and you have to think, man, if I'm ever gonna be able to afford one, now's the time because these prices are just climbing and it may never stop. Yeah, So I think yeah. there is a certain psychological element driving these prices up, isn't there? And, I think there's also an element of websites like Bring a Trailer yes. creating uh, this sort of bubble because they're, we're talking about premium cars on that site selling for premium, premium dollars yeah, yeah. in an auction environment where egos get attached to these yeah, things. Yeah. And it, I think that market is of such a small percentage mm -hmm. of the population. You have to remember these are you know wealthy people, car collectors that want these cars. Yeah. And for them, $100,000 is the equivalent of like, you know, a thousand bucks, yeah. right? To, to them versus what a hundred grand would be to us. And I think bring a trailer has brought this mentality of, you know, the, the premium car is at a, you know, sells for a hundred grand. Therefore my car that is a high mileage, like daily driver should fetch half of that or, or you or know, maybe, even, yeah. maybe uh, three quarters of that. And yeah. it is creating the perception that the car prices have, have come up, but you have to remember the idea of a low mileage car, they're very, very rare. Those vehicles are going to be worth money regardless. Yeah. You know, whether this, this is a bubble or it isn't, low mileage like mint vehicles are always going to fetch a premium, as you can see on Bring a Trailer. Sure. You know, if you go list a 150,000 mile Toyota Supra, is it going to fetch $130,000? No, there's no way. It might not even fetch fifty, sixty thousand dollars $60,000, right? Like you never know, but it's just like Dave said, the, the economy right now, the, the, the enthusiasts are all in this FOMO fear that if I don't get in now, mm -hmm. I'm going to have a hard time getting in in the future. And so they're willing to pay what I think are some overinflated prices yeah. on vehicles such as that, right? And yeah. it's, it's, it's a tough thing because it's almost, you're, you're gambling, you're playing this market. Like if you look at the stock market, it does fluctuate. Oh, it goes God, up yeah. and down. Yeah. Even the car market, like the Porsche 911 market, was super red hot. You know, when I bought my 930 Turbo, it was at a low. Now it, 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 it went up and like 2018, I think was the peak. 
and it's kind of like settled down. The 964 Turbo is a great example, actually. Mm -hmm. Those cars were produced in very, very low numbers, and they right now hover on bring a trailer anywhere from like a driver at 80, 85 to like, you know, to higher 120, 100, 160 for the low mileage ones. And you think like if the, the, the number of those vehicles, that should be way, way higher. And if you go online, you can see dealers listing those for a quarter million dollars. Does that mean they're getting them? No. No, not. who knows? You know, maybe they're out there fishing, but I think that's also an, an indication of what's happening here. There's a lot of people listing cars oh, God, for yeah. an exorbitant amount of money, and mm -hmm. that also continues to drive prices up because sure. people see, like, a guy lists his S2000 for 80 grand or 60 grand. Well, then, you know what? I'm going to list mine for 40. Okay, and then the, the high mileage one, well, I'm going to list mine for 20. When in reality, that is still a $10,000 or $15,000 car, yeah, right? Yeah, I see that even in my little uh, bubble that I live in, a first-gen Toyota Celicas or Celicas, where there was a, a very low mileage, mint condition one that sold on Bring a Trailer for like $65,000 yeah, US. Crazy. There was a bidding war between pe two people who really yeah. wanted it. And suddenly, a bunch of people were posting their nicely modified or relatively stock first gen Celicas online for, you know, asking $35,000, $40,000 because suddenly they think they're going to get big money for it. And a few of them have sold for decent money, uh, but I know a lot of them haven't sold, you know, they didn't meet reserve. So there's certainly it's, people out there that are fishing. There's yeah, no and, and, and about it. as I mentioned, it's kind of like the stock market. What you're doing is you're trying to like, you know, set a price here that people will buy at yeah. and you may get it yeah. or you may not. And every car is, is a different, uh, situation and case like mm -hmm. the, we know unmolested original cars are going to fetch big money but if your car is modified you know if it's been a daily driver mm -hmm. there's certainly so many variances so it's it's tough like the car market is changing quickly and this is usually what happens when it does have this like rapid increase you don't know what the value of vehicles are because there's so many variances that come into to play and I think that's a caution that people really need to look at when you, you have to be very very scrutineering of the cars that you're buying and you, when you're starting to pay these you know forty fifty thousand dollar price tags because if they are daily drivers you don't know exactly the history of them mm -hmm. you don't know what they've been through how many accidents they've had maybe they've been really repainted mm -hmm. you know there's we have a project coming up where you're going to see it's been in an accident but the title hasn't been branded and we could fix that obviously and not mention it didn't have an accident yeah. and you know if you fix it well enough some guy might come along and he might be hot for it and buy it without ever knowing. Yeah. And, and that does happen and that continues to happen, I think. Oh, you know, there's sure. a lot of people, like as true car enthusiasts, we don't do this for a flip. But there's a lot of people that are looking at this as a quick way, this market now as a way to flip cars and make money, make a quick, you know, five grand here, make a quick 10 grand here, clean a car up and sell it and turn it around. And I think that is also a negative part of, of what I feel is what, what creates a bubble is the true car enthusiast is slowly getting priced out by people that are coming in here, looking at these things as investments, mm -hmm. as ways to make money. Mm -hmm. And it just creates a market where if this changes quickly, if the wave kind of like settles down, then people are going to start selling and the, the, the prices will start dropping. Which would be a good thing from our perspective. Yeah. We could be able yeah. to afford these uh, <laughs> dream cars a lot more than we can now. But you raise an interesting question about supply and demand. And uh, with that 964 Turbo, for example, and then you look at other cars that are going through the roof right now, like, say, R34 GTRs. I know they didn't make a ton of those, yeah. but they made more of those than they did those 964 Turbos. Yes. And in other cases, like, say, FDR X7s, which aren't actually going on quite the same trajectory as a lot of the other cars. Yeah, that's the rotary, I think, the, the, the problem. Pulling but, it yeah. back a bit. But there's also a lot of supply. Like, yeah. they, they made over 70,000 FDs. Yes. Admittedly, like, 50,000 of those were made just for the Japanese market. But now that they're old enough, I mean, most countries, you could import one of those quite easily. Yeah. And that's true in a lot of other cases of these, like, collectible Japanese cars. They made them in more volume than a lot of people realize. Right, so right. if you're looking to buy a Japanese car as a, an investment, make sure you do your homework and figure out how many of these did they actually make. Because at the end of the day, supply and demand should really dictate prices. We're in a bubble right now. I don't think there's any question yes. about that. So you either try to time the market to make your money that way, and you can do that with any other type of investment. You're or, probably better off in the stock market. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Go buy some crypto or some weed yeah. stock or whatever you want to do. But, or you try to buy cars that are actually collectible because they're rare. Yeah. And not only are they rare, but they're desirable too. Yes. And I think that's a much more rare combination to have than we're seeing right now in the market. Because really, if you go on 
Craigslist or Kijiji or Facebook or whatever, it doesn't matter what car you search for right now, it could be junkers and they've quadrupled in price yeah, too. Yeah. It's like 10 grand is your buy-in price for anything these days almost, you know, except like the 350Zs and FRSs, like the newer cars are yes. still, a have a little bit of decline, but they've seen a, a bit of an increase too because people want to scoop them up, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, yeah, FRSs. But it's I like 10 I'm grand, man. Buying. Yeah. 10 grand is like that buy-in for, for I think anything, anything which is which is kind of crazy. And it makes it hard for the average enthusiast to get really excited about you know building a project when you have to spend so much money, you know, and there's a, a whole different other side of, you know, for example, two Jay-Z engines now selling for six to eight thousand dollars yeah. when they were two to three grand, you know, three, four years ago. So there's just like this this exponential amount of money now you gotta look at when you're building a project car, which ultimately for, for guys like us, and I'm sure for a lot of you guys, isn't a good thing per se, right? No, it definitely changes what you can build and what you may end up building because you are being limited on choices. The Evo 6 is a great example, I think, of a vehicle that is undervalued right now for the production numbers, mm -hmm. and mainly because the US, you guys have a 25-year import rule, and I think a lot of this market surge has also happened when that import law came into effect for the 90s Japanese cars. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden, it's like, holy smokes, look at we can start importing all these great cars. Yeah. And the market was on the, the upswing. And now the, the precedent of like what those vehicles are worth was is so much higher. We used to, honestly, we could have, we were buying R32 GTRs like drivers for 10,000 Canadian dollars. That's like eight grand US yeah. when they originally were importable into here. And getting back to the Evo 6, that car, you know, we bought what a couple years ago now for ten grand, grand yeah, ten thousand dollars. Canadian too. Yeah, so like and yeah. and you know, we, we put a bunch of work into it. We we kind of restored oh, yeah. it. Yeah, we restored that. But that vehicle now is probably like twenty to, to twenty five grand minimum, minimum, maybe more. But it hasn't seen that huge price increase. First, because there's probably not a lot of them. They're not extremely popular, and they're not importable into into the U.S. right now. Like Evo Four and five prices have started coming up because mm -hmm. they're right, like the fours are importable, the fives I think are just at that cusp and you yeah. can see the prices creeping. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that these prices are gonna drop and, and dip 40, 50%. You never know, mm -hmm. right? Like again, I can't time the market. I don't know what's going on. They may peter off here and just hold steady. They may drop down. Like the idea for me of uh, a $60,000 skyline or you know, non-GTR non -GTR, yeah, yeah. Uh, it, is kind of hard to wrap around when for $60,000 you can go buy so many like good M2 vehicles. Competition. Yeah, like, like wow. you know, it, geez, like 997, 911s, yeah, like yeah. there's so many great cars that you can buy for that. And I think what's gonna happen is once people kind of see like, holy smokes, I need to pay that. Let me see what else is, excuse me, on the market. And you're gonna see people kind of starting to walk away from that. And not, that's not to say, you know, like the BMW market hasn't skyrocketed. The Porsche market, like I said, is, is kind of yeah, cooled kind of off and, and, yeah. and, and flattened because people understand like what those vehicles are worth. We, we have to talk about the Integra Type R. Yeah, we Because do. those have been seeing like record numbers on Bring a Trailer. Mm -hmm. And the Integra Type R is our version of like the Copo Camaro or the Shelby Mustang of years previous. It mm. is going to be the car that collectors want. It is going to be the car that we grew up pining. Like if you were a Honda guy, if you were yeah. an import guy, the Type R name is just synonymous, right? Sure, and that was really the first, you know, great Type R. Interestingly, we did a little research before this and realized that they actually made more DC2 Integra Type Rs than we thought. Yeah. Like for the US market, I think they sold around 3,800 of them. So that's a pretty low production. Yeah, run. for sure it is. And they made over 40,000 of them. And there's, you know, they made some for the Australian market, the UK market, and so on. So, so it's not as rare a car no. as you might think, except they've all been stolen yeah. or written yeah. off it and turned yeah. into race cars. Yeah. So I don't know what the true like survivor numbers are. I'm, it might be half that. It might be yeah. less than half that. I wouldn't be surprised if it was yeah. less. And then the ones that are stock, like th that's why those cars are always going to be worth money. And that's why when you see them selling mm -hmm. for you know, 60, 70 grand on Bring a Trailer, it, it, to me, it, it does make sense. What doesn't make sense is when I see people listing you know, K-swapped ones, track cars mm -hmm. for 40, 50,000 dollars, high mileage yeah. cars. Like there's people out there again that, just have a hard, to, I think, a, a hard time to realize like where their car fits in, yeah. and that's understandable. Like I'm not faulting people for doing that, but at the same time, it's you do need to be realistic, right? Yeah, like, I think it's also worth discussing the fact that 
you know, if, if I go back to the point about the car needing to be both rare and special yes. to really be long-term, you know, valuable and collectible. I mean, I love the Integra Type R. I have, I've owned one, and yeah. I think it's one of the greatest front-wheel drive car ever built. But it's also just like based on a economy car chassis. Yes. Um, it's you know they did make it in fairly large numbers, and it was built to a price. It was only a you know twenty-five to thirty thousand dollar car in its day, where. You know, as a Honda fanboy, if I look at, say, the NSX as compared to that, yeah. far lower production numbers, yeah. very specialized aluminum chassis, you know, it, this, built to compete against the best supercars in the world and beat them, frankly, like the, you know, 348 Ferraris and the 911s. Yeah. You know, when they tested that car versus those best cars in the world in magazine land, the NSX was winning. So, like, to me, that is a car that is truly collectible in the sense that it's, you know, engineered in a very specific and specialized way, produced in truly low numbers. Uh, the engine wasn't really that exotic, which is part of why it was a great car, because it was actually reliable right, a car yeah. that you drive every day. But like, what, if I look at investing in a Honda, as much as I love Integra Type R's, I'm going to put my money in an NSX, because it's long-term, yeah. a much rarer car and a much more sort of special car. And the driving experience kind of warrants the price tag, right? Like you said, with the Type R, the engine is really what makes it special, yes. but the rest of the driving experience, it's still a cheap Integra in there, you it know? Is, and and for some people, that m might be the specialness of it. Yeah. But for me, I, you know, when you get into it, it's still a kind of a tin can yeah. Honda that you're driving yeah. around, where an NSX... <sighs> it feels like more of a, an occasion to drive that yes. car, too. Not that a lot of people are buying these cars to drive them. I don't know. No. Do you, you buy one of these cars, do you just park it? Maybe these days, that's what's uh, happening. Uh, that, so That makes me sad on the inside, but... In any case, I don't want to devalue Integra Type R's. I think they're amazing cars, but they're not as rare as people think, and they're not as exotic as a lot of the truly collectible, low production number exotics are. So I think that's, you know, if you want to use the rational half of your brain when making these kinds of investments, I think you do have to look beyond the bubble and think, long term, is this really something that is going to increase in value? Yeah, and, and just remember when you look at this kind of stuff, cars require maintenance. Mm -hmm. There's insurance that, you know, if you've bought a $60,000, $70,000 car, you put it on Haggerty, it's still cheap, but it's not pennies. You know, it's usually yeah. about $1,000 or whatever, six, 700 bucks a year. When you start adding that up over the timeline and, you know, parts, yeah. all that stuff, depreciation if you drive it. Mm -hmm. So it, it's certainly like you're, if you're looking to make money, the stock market is kind of the, the better way to go. But I get it. We as car enthusiasts, like this is the first time in history that you know you can go to your wife and say, "Listen, honey, mm -hmm. I'm buying a car which is going to appreciate." And I think that's also a, a huge driving factor right now. Is you can convince your significant other or yourself that by buying a vehicle, you're actually making an investment. And they were depreciating in, mm -hmm. uh, investments in the past. You wouldn't say to yourself, "Oh, I'm going to go buy a Supra and it's going to appreciate for me, and I'm going to be able to drive it." No, it was always, "All right, how much am I going to lose?" Yeah. on this car by driving it three to four years. Like most new cars, if you buy a new car, you don't get what you put into it five years later. Yeah. But the, the opposite is what's happening yeah. right now. And I did, that is certainly, I think, a driving force where people are like willing to spend this money because they think they'll get it back. Yeah, and they're buying something tangible that they love. Yeah. It's almost like buying art. You know, it's something you can park in your garage and just enjoy it aesthetically. Even if you're not gonna drive it, at least you can enjoy it physically and see it there and have it be a part of your life in that way where with some of the current investments out there, say like uh, you know, cr cryptocurrencies or these new NFTs that yes, people are buying, like yes. digital assets that you're buying, like that, that to me is a much more abstract idea and it might be harder to convince your wife on, where yeah. if you can say, listen, honey, I can buy this physical asset that can live in our garage and will appreciate in value and makes me happy just looking at, then that, maybe that's an easier sell for these guys to make. I, I don't know. but. Personally, if I'm buying any of these cars, I'm n I know I'm going to devalue them by driving them. So in closing, I think just remember when you're buying these types of cars, just be very, very critical. Do your research. You know, right now, money is cheap. People have a lot of it. That doesn't mean that it's always going to be that way. Mm -hmm. we, and, you know, the last thing I want to see is a lot of people being soured and losing their money on, on buying cars that they paid, you know, double or whatever, 20, 30% more than they, than they should, should have, have yeah. banking on something. So be very, very critical of the vehicles that you are buying. And remember, buy stuff that you want, not for the fact that you think it's going to be a worthwhile investment, because again, you just never know what's going to happen. I constantly look for cars, search for them, and I still don't know which one's gonna be the next one. Is our Evo 6 going to be the gold mine that we're sitting on, or is it never going to pop? Is it always gonna be this car that's like mid-tier for pricing? You just never ever know, right? Mm -hmm. No, it's true, and I think, you know, with our R34 GTR, for example, we know that car is very valuable right yes. now. 
and it frankly probably will always remain that, that way because right. that is a rare car. Yes, yes. And it's a highly desirable, very special car. Yes. So I, I get why that car is worth as much as it's yes. worth. Yeah. It makes me a little sad that it's priced such that so few people could ever enjoy one, but yeah. it makes me a little happy that we bought it as cheaply as we did. Exactly. We really bought it before this bubble. So, yes. you know, there's going to be situations where if you're a car guy buying a bunch of stuff, occasionally you're going to get lucky. You're going to buy something like that where you make some money on. But yeah. ultimately, at the end of the day, if you're in this as a car enthusiast, you know, buy what your heart wants, enjoy it. Maybe you get lucky, maybe you don't, but at least you have the experience of enjoying that car, which it, for us, I think, is really what it's all about. Yeah. All right, guys, that's a wrap on this one. Make sure to post in the comments your thoughts. We would love to hear what you guys think of the car market right now and what our opinion on it is. So please post in the comments. Thank you so much for watching. If you like this video, certainly give us a thumbs up or give us a thumbs down if you think we're crazy here and car prices are gonna continue to go up. What a machine, I'm in love, guys, I'm in love. Man, this thing is absolutely glued to the racetrack. A little bit of a drift.